tarde. Boa tarde. Boa tarde. Boa tarde. Good afternoon. Or whatever time it might happen to be. I really wish I was with you in Lisbon. But everybody's plans have been disrupted by the coronavirus. Oh, get this thing out of here. So this afternoon, or whatever time it happens to be when you're watching this, we're going to look at test-driven development guided by zombies. The three excerpts I'm going to show you are from my soon-to-be-released self-paced training course for test-driven development, specifically designed for embedded systems engineers, but generally applicable to anybody using C or C++. You might want to take a look at it. One of the things that people just starting with test-driven development tell me is that they're concerned they won't be able to think of the tests. And I gotta say, I probably had that same concern when I first saw test-driven development. But let me assure you that if you know what your code is supposed to do, and that's kind of a big if sometimes, you can be guided by zombies. One behavior at a time, defining one test after another. Now, something about being guided by zombies that will be helpful to you is that it helps you create good interfaces. And that's a second short segment that's in this talk. And then I finished the talk with what if you don't know what your code is supposed to do? I used to say, if you don't know what your code is supposed to do, how could you possibly write the code? People tell me, if I don't know what my code is supposed to do, I won't know what test to write. And my first kind of flippant answer to them was, if you don't know what your code is supposed to do, how can you go write the code? You'll see my story about how I discovered, oftentimes we don't know what code we need to write, and which means we don't know what test to write. So we have to discover what the code needs to do by writing some code. But that's the essence of my talk, those three parts, and I look forward to maybe having an opportunity uh, to meet you one day or to talk to you in the Q&A session afterwards. So I hope you have some questions for me. And I hope I can get to Lisbon once this darn thing is gone. <laughs>so you don't think you're going to know what test to write. It can be kind of daunting. How am I going to think of these tests? Back when I was learning, Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries would tell me, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. And that means, you know, what, pick a really stupid test case first? Yeah, pick something really simple that will work and start to get your wheels turning. And this do the simplest thing that could possibly work, very catchy acronym, isn't it? It often meant taking really simple next steps. And you can see this kind of cooked into what you've seen so far in test-driven development. But how do we get started? Is there a way to think about this? And how do we make sure we don't forget other tests? Well, you'll be happy to know you could be guided by zombies. So in our first example, I gave you the tests. You had to figure those tests out. That's about as hard as writing them. In the beginning, the tests were written for you. Later, you wrote the test. So you're growing some skill. But you might be concerned about not being able to think of what test to write. I've got some help for you. Test-driven development can be guided by zombies. <laughs> guided by zombies? Seriously, James? Uh, yes, guided by zombies. Let me explain. Well, if you've got my book, maybe you read about 01N. In the early days of me learning test-driven development, the examples always seemed to start out very simple, and they would grow to rich, full behavioral capabilities. With Circular Buffer, we started with very simple test cases, the easiest ones you get to pass where you could get away with hard-coded return results. And as you grew the behavior, you added little bits and pieces as you went, and eventually ended up with the rich, full implementation. 01N was what I talked about in the book. I was telling a friend of mine, Tim Ottinger, and he said, 01N, oh, there's a name for that, ZOM, 01Many. In groups of developers I was teaching test-driven development that had this concern, I started talking to them about 01Many. Well, let's, let's start out. 01Many, what does it mean in this context? The first tests I focus on are what I consider the zero test, the simplest test, the post conditions to create, the simplest scenarios you can come up with. Circular buffer is a good example to describe the zombies idea because literally, the zero tests are about when the circular buffer is empty. You could ask it some questions. How should it behave? The one tests are about when it holds precisely one item. 
And there's some behaviors that would be special there because zero one edge is a boundary condition. Zero and one are special cases, as Tim told me. And M or many is a generalization. Two is the first of the generalizations. Now these zero tests help us define a boundary condition and an interface. So we catalog in our test cases how a boundary behaves. And we also are the first users of a new interface. So while things are really simple, we're defining interfaces. And very simple, we're defining edge conditions, the interesting places where the failures come from, the edge conditions. So we're focusing on those right away. After we run out of the zero tests, we start thinking about what could we do to the circular buffer that might change its state. And of course, right away we think of put, because if we put to an empty circular buffer, it won't be empty anymore. So we're defining the interface for circular buffer put, and we're also cataloging the behavior of an edge condition. What happens when a circular buffer goes from empty to holding one thing? And then, next, we think of get, another interface. Take the last thing out of a circular buffer, it should be empty. Ah, there's another edge condition. Have you ever had your system fail because of some edge condition that you didn't test? Well, here we're focusing on those specifically. Now our interfaces are defined, and we're going to turn our attention to the algorithm inside of the circular buffer and make it be a FIFO. After we have FIFO working, the general behavior of the collection of integers in this case, we're going to turn our attention to the exceptional things that might happen, like putting and causing a wraparound or getting and causing a wraparound. These are all things that we have to be concerned with. And in the spirit of looking for the exceptional things that could happen, it's also helpful to just take a step back at some point and look at your work and see, is there anything we didn't think of? Are there abuse cases? Are there errors that might happen that you haven't considered? So we want to take a look at those things. Throughout the zombie approach is keeping the scenarios simple. When I've gone and visited experienced groups at unit testing, and I start to show them test-driven development, and we have these nice, small, concise test cases, nice, simple test cases, oftentimes their prior work were large do-everything test cases, something I would call a run-on test. It, there might be some stigma out there against keeping it simple, right? As engineers, we tend to complicate things. And in the zombies approach, we're going to keep those test cases, simple scenarios, a single path through the code. So that's zombies. <laughs> Maybe that's your first two-dimensional acronym. Well, I'm hoping you're a little less concerned about being able to think of the tests now. And if you're still concerned about thinking of all the tests, you know, why didn't you think of all the tests? Is it because you didn't know everything your code should do? Uh, well, if that's the case, having tests or not having tests, you still wouldn't know everything your code's supposed to do. So how do you protect yourself against not knowing what the code should do and making sure you're correct? Well, reviews, pair programming, mob programming, all fit into that extra safety mechanism, maybe that you have in place already to make sure you don't forget things. And then of course, the next layer up of testing is going to help you understand where you were wrong because the best that something like test-driven development and zombies can do is for you to have code that's doing what you think it's supposed to do. That might sound like a deficiency. It doesn't show your code is right, but it shows that your code is doing what you think it's supposed to do. And that's actually very powerful because oftentimes your code works by accident. Two defects offsetting each other makes the test pass. We're trying to drive that out. We want our code to work on purpose. Have you ever fixed a bug and then caused one or more other bugs? Uh, sure, of course, this happens to us all the time. And some of those cases are offsetting defects. If you fix this bug and break this code, this code worked by accident. So <laughs> I want my code to work on purpose. I'm hoping you do too. And if you let yourself be guided by zombies, I think most of your code's gonna be working on purpose. Test-driven development. It has a nice side effect in that it helps us build good interfaces. Did you ever get together with a group of developers in a room and you all define your H files, the interfaces that you're going to do so you could work independently, and then you all go scatter to the winds and, and go work in your little corner for a while, and then you bring everything back together and find out you all had different ideas of what people meant and how to use something? In this interface, it looked really nice on a whiteboard, turned out to be really inconvenient to use. 
well, with the zombie approach. Interface is first-class citizen. You're going to use the interface. Interfaces exist for the benefit of the client. So we're going to use the interface first before there's anything behind it. Did you ever let the implementation of the thing you're building dictate what interface was created? And now you have an inconvenient object to use. Instead, we want the user of the object to use the interface first so that it can be convenient for them. And the zombie approach encourages that. As soon as I've gotten the idea of the interface that I would like, now I have to go make it real in the code. Did you ever have this great idea for an interface and then found out that in C or C++ it wasn't that convenient to use? I want to find that out as soon as possible because it's an important design decision. And I'm having to deal with the realities of those languages, drawing on my knowledge of C and C++. Now maybe I don't wire new objects together every day. And then finally, after I've wired together my object and kind of proven out that the interface is reasonable to use, then I dive in and work on the implementation. A few years ago, I had my kind of wise guy remark about if you don't know what the code's supposed to do, how could you write the code? Come back and bite me. I was working with my brother on a prototype. He had a concept for a system that would start measuring water pressure down at an analog to digital converter, which would be connected through a network, uh, IoT network, up to a little Linux box and through a WAN to an Android tablet. So in real time, we can measure these water pressures. I did a talk about this topic at the Agile Technical Conference in Nashville a few years ago. So zombies, you're familiar with already, zombies are, if we know the problem we're trying to solve or know something about the problem we're trying to solve, we can use behaviors and drive those in and grow this code. But if you don't know what the code's supposed to do, what are we supposed to do then? Well, in extreme programming, we call it a spike, where we're going to do a series of experiments to kind of drill through all the layers and go discover what it means to do something from end to end. And the pragmatic programmers, they talk about tracer bullets. And another concept is a walking skeleton, where we get enough of the pieces together so we can see if it is possible to do what we're trying to do in a reasonable way. So in these layers upon layers, how do we talk to this analog to digital converter over a spy bus? How do we talk to this little IoT controller that speaks to a little Linux box over this IoT network? How do we pass messages back and forth? How do we put together a web server in the little Linux box to talk to a tablet? Or a dedicated application in the Linux box that talks to a tablet? There were choices to make, and there were a lot of unknowns. So what do we do? We start shooting tracer bullets so we can learn what's happening inside that hardware. We can start to discover what's needed. So first we had to qualify the radio vendor. How do we send messages between a little Linux box and a little radio? We've got to find out what that performance is. We've got to find out some things about that. We've got to just find out how to do it at all to see if it's practical in the hardware that we were looking at using. So this continues and we investigate each of those layers of, of uncertainty, discovering what's needed each layer. Every time we would discover what needed to be done at a layer, we'd try to minimize the dependency on the thing outside of our control. So a lot of these problems, the I don't know what code to write, happens a lot at the boundary when we're using third-party devices or third-party code, third-party libraries. So we would discover that the thing could do what we wanted it to do, and then our mission was to make that as small and uncomplicated as possible so that we could grow the behavior, the business logic, in a rather independent way from that third-party code. From a design perspective, think adapter. So my code interacts with third-party something, either radio or library, through an adapter. I don't have much of my code at all depending directly on the third-party code. Let me ask you, what would you rather have when you go move your business logic to a new platform? Do you want to have a lot of dependency connections on the platform, or do you just want to have a few dependency connections on the platform? Um, well, <laughs> I'm in the later camp. I only want a few. So I carefully manage that dependency thinking that we are likely to change that vendor and we don't want that to cost a lot. And it turns out that those are excellent test points too. An attribute of that code when we're finished is that the little adapters or the little bits of code that are dependent on the third party may or may not have tests. They might be you know, because we're interacting with hardware there. We would need an integration test and then we have to decide if it's worth automating that. 
and for a prototype, it wasn't worth us automating that integration test. If your third-party dependency is on software, let's say an XML library or a JSON library, you're going to want to write learning tests. You need to learn it anyway, so why not write some tests for how you plan on using it? These learning tests, they also turn into contract tests because later when you take the next release, and if you've got your interface and your adapter for how you use this parser, you can run your tests against that new release in the future. I know, of course, you're not afraid to take new releases of third-party libraries. Uh, wait, maybe we are sometimes because we can't count on what new bugs they might have or maybe changes that aren't compatible with how we're doing things right now. We might depend on their old bugs. The adapters are small and maybe such low cyclomatic complexity with one or two paths through the code that we don't even need to bother testing them. Or maybe they interact with hardware, in which case we have to consider whether or not we want a hardware integration test and if taught, we should automate that. If you're developing drivers yourself, you'll probably test drive those. And we're going to get into an example of that later in the course. We haven't talked about what happened to the application code. As we squeezed down this dependency, we ended up making very rich modules of behavior and business logic, which is just about our business. And so we could wrap tests around that. And those are the most important tests for us to have. And because you're doing test-driven development, you completely cover that code with tests. Not that 100% test coverage is our goal, but that's what happens when you do test-driven development and you isolate code from its dependencies. And then when the time comes and you need to move your code to a different platform, your application code is kind of ready to move. It won't be completely ready to move because you'll probably never get all the dependencies out of it, but you'll be able to a lot more easily move it than that code that had unmanaged dependencies. Well, I'm not sure if I stayed on track during this whole conversation here about what to do when you don't know what your code's supposed to do. But a couple ideas are, you know, start doing spikes or fire tracer bullets to understand the technology you have to work with, and then isolate those dependencies so that the other parts of the code you can attack with zombies.